Welcome, everybody. I can't tell you how exciting it is to be back in a room full of voices chattering and being eating and drinking. Yeah, cheers, right? <laughs> it's been, uh, we were putting up the women in autonomy sign earlier, and we said it's been three years since we've done this. So just thank you for making the effort to come out. Um, I'm curious, how, by a show of hands, how many of you have ridden in a ro robo taxi before? That's a lot. Okay, how many that are not employees of Cruise or Waymo or Zook? Super <laughs> Nintendo. Okay, like still a fair amount. So thank you to the folks at Cruise tonight. Um, one for hosting this amazing event. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and two, for providing an experiential element and letting us uh, go for robo-taxi rides at the end. So Kelsey will be sharing some information on that a little bit later. So my name is Jen Deitch. I'm the program manager at Women in Autonomy. And this is an organization that was founded by Indu uh, in 2019 and is here to educate, equip, and empower women building autonomous technologies across industries especially in automotive and auto tech. So we really have a mission to uh, make sure women's voices are better heard and represented in these industries. And um, that's why we have these amazing female leaders here tonight. So without further ado, we'll get into our panel on the future of robo taxis. I'd like to introduce Indu. Uh, she's my colleague and also the founder of Women in Autonomy. Wendy, uh, Indu in her day job is the director of product management at AI and she was formerly at Delphi Aptiv, where she was a senior software engineer. So, Indu, thanks for moderating. Thank you, Jen. That's a wonderful in introduction by Jen. She probably drives via at this point. <laughs> and thank you, all of you, for joining today. And as Jen mentioned, this is such a wonderful to see so many people in front of us. And we've all been hearing about robo-taxis. It's been probably more than a decade that Robo taxis, you have either seen some of them driving on your streets and or, or collecting data with different sensors on it, etc. And recently it's been a been a big ride, a further on the cap on the people who've been working on it, where we are finally getting to the step of scaling robo taxis. This is a really interesting point in the industry and it's time and we have a wonderful, wonderful panel here with a lot of knowledge from different backgrounds. I want to I want to introduce a, have this opportunity to introduce each one of them and give a background about the expertise and an overview of what they do in their regular life. Uh, I guess I'm I'm first. Um, well, first of all, I guess I'm the only cruiser in on the panel. So on behalf of Cruise, welcome everyone. Thanks uh, so much for coming here. It's really really exciting to see so many uh, women interested in autonomy. And just like Jen said, COVID has set us back for three years. It's really great to actually see actual faces uh, together. And welcome to men too. Um, <laughs> we wish to see more of you. Um, so a quick introduction about myself. Um, I am the VP of Technical Strategy and Execution at Cruise. Um, it's a mouthful, but what it really means is that I manage a team that sets uh, program level milestones. I manage the uh, technical product management team that sets the uh, product roadmap. And I also manage our TPM program that um, manages the execution of the deliveries. So this is what I do at Cruise. Um, and then before Cruise, I was running a much smaller startup called DeepMap, um, which was focusing on doing HD mapping, localization, routing, and so on. And then before COVID, I also had a privilege to work with Jen and Indu and attended one of the um, earlier Women in Autonomy panels. So that, that's why I still have the t-shirt. So it's good to be back. Hey everyone, um, I'm Aradia. Uh, I work at NVIDIA. I'm a senior product manager leading the RoboTaxi products and strategy. Um, this is my first Women in Autonomy event and definitely won't be my last. It's really cool. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here and like talk to you all about what RoboTaxis are today and where it'll go tomorrow. As usual, I'm the odd chick out because I don't do RoboTaxis. I do really big trucks, class A, eight excuse me, uh, autonomous trucks. I'm Michelle Avery. I'm the Vice President of Product Strategy, do a lot of work in safety, as well as government affairs for InRide. I've been doing mobility work for well over 20 years. I've got the hair to prove it. And mostly doing really, really complicated 
technology products that are well ahead of the regulatory curve. I'm looking at you because you were just talking about connected car and data, and it, it's a flashback. It's going to give me an eye twitch. Really working on these for companies like Toyota. I worked with Harman, Eris, and worked with companies like VW. <laughs> so I'm looking at over here at Carson. And, um, we worked together at Harman. Um, and also working with companies like Hyundai, Honda, Mitsubishi, really on these cutting edge stuff. And for those who don't know InRide, because you can't take a ride in one, it is a, it's a cabless um, autonomous electric truck. So it is purpose built similar to your Origin or to Zook's um, RoboTaxi as well. We also have human driven trucks that are all electric. And the reason why is because that's what we're all about is decarbonization. And we're doing this through digitalization to drive efficiencies, and then also through electrification and autonomy as well. So that's what we really need to make a, make a difference. Just realized I did not say my name, but my name is up there, so. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So. That's a very good uh, introduction from all our uh, panelists here. And I wanted to d dive deeper into robotaxis in general. We have seen a lot of the proliferations of self-driving ta taxis in the city. What are the impacts that you see in the society with the deployment of this technology? And I will go with Wei uh, to start. All right, so first of all, I hope all of you get a chance to take a ride and inform your own opinion afterwards. Um, you know, from my perspective, I guess I've been in the self-driving industry for a while at this moment, I guess, um, not 10 years, but you know, we're getting close to, to that. Um, I'm still extremely passionate. Um, the reason I really believe in this mission is number one, it's extremely hard. Like, you know, I feel like you only get once in a lifetime to work on something that is extremely hard. And this is uh, probably the hardest thing I can find uh, in my lifetime. So I'm very passionate about that. But from a society, you know, impact perspective, I think really the problem we're trying to solve here is how can we actually make our street safer? At the end of the day, self-driving is not about making money. I mean, there's it's a, it's a side effect, right? It's a nice byproduct out of it. Um, it's really about, the mission is really about how we can actually save lives. And I mean, I know that there are a lot of the cruisers here and um, all of you know, like the number one thing that cruise um, uh, culture is about safety. And this is really baked into, I believe, not only a cruise culture thing, but it's really baked into the mission of the self-driving. And and that's probably the biggest impact we actually see from the fact that we can deploy um, self-driving as a technology. There are, of course, many other things. You know, people talk about how can we actually reduce pollution because you can have more cars on the street and then therefore you can reduce the um, ownership of uh, personal cars. Um, another, you know, interesting side effect that people, I'm not sure people know, like, you know, um, the study shows that in urban traffic, almost 30% of the um, urban traffic actually comes from cars just looking for parking. Um, we can reduce parking. We can reduce the need to park, right? Um, and then that's 30% of traffic that is not needed anymore. Many, many benefits, but I'll stop here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've also been in the industry for close to 10 years, not quite, but getting there. Uh, super passionate about it as well. Um, economic impacts or just general societal impacts, I guess, re reduction in car ownership, right? Like once robot taxis become more prevalent, we don't need to own as many cars. Um, they can pick us up wherever we want, take drop us off wherever we want, and then come back and pick us up to, to go somewhere else, right? Um, urban planning and uh, just space optimization in the cities. Like how many of you drove here today? I drove around multiple times to try, try and find a parking spot, right? Like we don't have to do that if robot taxis become more prevalent. Um, the other thing is also for elderly and disabled people. Today, they're more like re they rely on others to take them places. But when robot taxis become more prevalent, they become more autonomous and they get more of their independence back, which I think is a really, really cool um, impact for them, right? Like they can just live their lives. Um, I guess the other things would be just reduction in the number of fatalities and road accidents today that happen um, every day due to human negligence and human distraction, right? Like 
I've seen many, many distracted drivers. I do not want to be on the road with them if I don't have to. So I'm really looking forward to robot taxis. At NVIDIA, we do believe um, autonomous vehicles is the future of transportation. So heavily invested in it. Really, really want to make sure that it's safe. Um, there's like there's a saying we do, like we say at NVIDIA, where it's like we definitely want to do everything right, but we don't want absolutely don't want to do anything wrong. So I think that's the most important aspect. So like safety is really important. But yeah, Michelle. I'm going to Michelle, and she brings a totally different uh, perspective to this from the trucking industry. It's been a long time, so. If, I don't know how many of you know, trucking industry has been in the space much ahead of robo taxis. So from your perspective, I'd like to ask you to add that perspective to how and what are the like, what are the takeaways to robo taxi you can bring in? Well, first off, I'm also a big fan of autonomy and robo taxis, and I want everyone to be an enormous success um, because you are leading the way. These amazing cities that you're rolling out and the high numbers and the scalability, you're proving the point that we're benefiting from on the trucking side, so thank you. Same on things like what we were talking about before, data. These are big issues, and so we've been really following a lot of what's happening in the robo-taxi industry because it will impact the trucking industry. Now, we do a lot of coalition work. We're, we're all working uh, together on a lot of these issues because there are commonalities. For InRide specifically, where we're very different, we are 100% electric. And I love the fact that Cruz is also 100% electric. Great job on your charging infrastructure. That's another one I've been really looking at quite a bit. Um, that's really, really important for us is to really drive the efficiencies of the use of the powertrain. For us right now, the autonomous piece we're doing in closed industrial areas. These are places where they're highly scheduled. They're very, very productive. They do tend to be lower speed. They also are boring. These are the most, you can't get a truck driver to do them. We're literally out in rural Tennessee and you can't find a driver that wants to do what we call a milk run. Go to a manufacturing line, drive to a finished goods warehouse, turn around, do it again and again and again. And what companies are looking for, dependability. They want reliability, they want uptime. And these are the things that we're able to bring to them to prove out the business model. And this is really, really an important launching point as we begin to increase the range with these power, with these electric powertrains and these weight class, as well as be able to work on going at higher speeds and more complex environments. For us, I mean, you guys are tackling crazy vulnerable road users. For us, we also have a lot on these manufacturing sites, but they are more constrained. But we do need to integrate the technology with dock workers. We do need to look at mixed use traffic and other situations. So it's, uh, there's just a tremendous amount of upside. And I am all for not killing people, <laughs> either through emissions or running them over, you know, this is, and I do also believe that autonomy has that ability, particularly when it's combined with an electric powertrain. Thank you. So we started to touch about the challenges that's coming to robot taxis. This, it's, and that's something which is I mean, difficult to find. Each person has their own way of tackling these challenges. So from your perspective, Wade, like wh what are the problems that you see or uh, technology challenges that you see in current robot taxi implementations? I'll say like, you know, again, safety first, we talked about that and um, we'll never launch or scale something that is not safe. Um, having said that, I think, you know, Cruise has been tackling this problem for a couple of years. Um, we're relatively, I would say, in a comfortable spot. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say we have solved the problem, but our performance is several times higher than a human benchmark in terms of safety. Um, again, not diminishing how hard it is to solve the problem of not killing people or hurting people or scaring people even. Um, I think for us, um, at this stage at least, like I think the hardest, actually it's not just for cruise, as in general, the hardest technology challenge is to how to make cars behave like humans so that a robo taxi can 
um, uh, so other drivers on the road have the same expectation and the interaction with robo taxi as if they are have with another human driven car. And that's very hard, right? Because not only it's about how the car behave in these corner cases, um, but then we also have to somehow signal and communicate with other road users, you know, maybe other drivers, maybe other pedestrians and bikers and construction workers and law enforcement officers, despite the fact that we do not have a human in the car to communicate, right? So we need to actually develop some way to signal our intention. Um, you know, we have uh, two models, cars for people who don't know. Uh, we have something called BALT, uh, which hopefully you know, some of you can get to ride today. And they're modified cars, you know, using sense, sorry, using the existing vehicle platform by putting sensors on top. We also have a purpose-built vehicle called Origin. Origin is maybe more powerful, um, and BALT is not, right? It's uh, just a regular car with a bunch of sensors on top. So how to actually make cars behave like humans and how to have other um, road users to also have similar level of understanding of this car's intention, that to me is very, very hard to solve technically. And, you know, we just need to keep on working on it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, you touched on it, right? Like safety, I think is the most important aspect of robot taxis because it's literally a supercomputer on wheels lugging people around with no human intervention or no human supervision, right? So it's, it's a huge task to make sure that it's safe. But what you see in the vehicle is only maybe like 40% of it. The huge infrastructure that goes into place behind the scenes, like the data center, the training, data generation, um, synthetic data generation, um, data recording of all the corner cases, uh, simulation to make sure that your technology is working correctly the way you want it to in corner cases that you can't replicate in real life, right? All of that makes such huge difference and it's not an easy task. Um, I think for me, the biggest challenge would be how can we prove that robotaxis are at a place where we like, I am confident to write in it, right? Like, how can we prove it to the public? Um, I don't think that's an easy task. Um, Cruz is leading the way over in that, and I fully appreciate it because I see so many cruise cars on the road. It's really amazing. Um, but yeah, that's some of the challenges that I see. I really appreciate uh, the expectations comment, you know, that idea of roadmanship. And we do, vehicles do have a way to signal their intent, right? You've got turn signals, assuming you actually use them. You have brake lights, backup beepers. When I was taking a cruise in Austin, it's, it's very funny, I was standing on the corner, we were waiting for it to pull over and I was waving at it. And I was like, I kind of stopped and went, oh, that's funny. <laughs> it's not going to see me, but then I watched it pull over. Very safe location. I, I by do the way. it too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have I know a it doesn't look at my ah. posture, but actually it does to some degree. But uh, <laughs> you know, at the same time, you know, when I see my my right arriving, it's like. <laughs> but it it literally waited for the right place on the curb to pull over, and I was like, brilliant. I love that. So it was reconditioning my expectations. And we do a lot of that um, at Enride is working, as I said before, with dock workers to really, because you are changing the way that people work. Um, one of the bigger things that we've been looking at a lot, particularly on the roadmanship issue, as you increase speeds and work and, and operate in mixed traffic is, People are terrible drivers around heavy duty trucks. They do not appreciate how much these things weigh, the stopping distance, they cut them off, and it's just, it's horrifying to me. And I wish we, in this country particularly, did a better job training drivers to really truly understand what it means when you're in a mixed traffic around these vehicles. So anticipating for stupid is really very, very hard. And I'm so, <laughs> I'm so sorry to put it that bluntly, but that is really, really hard. Now, as I said before at Enride, we're lucky right now because we are in these closed areas. And so we have an ability to really train people and work on those expectations but these are incredibly hard problems including things like connectivity so do we I all know get a minute to room... make a quick comment yes, yes please. because uh, what you said about anticipating stupidity um, is uh, something that 
we see as well. I mean, again, for some of the cruisers, maybe you have seen some of these video clips, but uh, when something new is on the street, like people are very curious to explore to some degree where they're putting their own safety at risk, right? So we got people who are chasing self-driving cars. We got people who are riding on a car on top of, on the roof of our cars. We got people put like their hats over our sensors to the extreme case where people um, would <clears throat> jump right in front of a car like while the car is moving at full speed people um riding their scooter chase up to our car and then literally jump right in front of our car um and this is where you know i would just say like again why i'm such a strong believer that self-driving cars can actually save people life if you put a human driver behind the wheel under such situation no matter how hard you pray uh, you press the brake you won't be able to stop from a collision event. But with self-driving car, because we have full control and then we hardwire uh, directly into the braking system, we can actually press, not even press, we can actually engage the brake at a level that a human driver is never able, allowed to mechanically, right? And that's why we can avoid some of these, uh, I mean, actually, uh, we, we do not have a collision event with any pedestrian at this moment, uh, despite, you know, the fact that people are taunting our cars. I also want to address, it's incredibly hard to deal with trailers on trucks. I know, I'm like, <laughs> it's, it's a whole different challenge. I've been in an autonomous truck before, and let me tell you, it's scary. <laughs> and the fact that you're able to do it safely, I think, says a lot. Well, you know, Wei was really hitting on something very important here. And I think this is one of the things that will probably be one of the biggest unintended side effects, or maybe in our case, intended side effects of autonomy is the purpose built vehicle. The fact that you can build these things with drive by wire and these systems that are meant to be highly responsive and are fully incorporated. And thank you to NVIDIA as well for the advances there to help with that. Because right now, most of the vehicles on the road don't make any sense. And this is an area where we really need to change the form factors to, to actually begin working better for us. And I think autonomy is going to really crack that open well above and beyond anything as InRide is doing with our cabless trucks or even with the Origin and these other vehicles. And there's, I think it's going to be very exciting. But it is hard, you know, like we're, I was about to talk about connectivity, which is an issue that we deal with a lot because we're in rural areas. And the ADS, the uh, automated driving system, doesn't need connectivity, but we do when we're interacting with people on the docks and as well as for video feeds and for other issues of it. And if these vehicles aren't connected, then they're really not very useful. We need to be able to hail them and communicate with them. And so connectivity does become an issue. All of these technology challenges, there comes the government related regulations and other things. So there's been actually took the recent years, there's been a lot of UN regulations that help passenger vehicles and ADAS in general. But how does how is this changing for robot taxis? And I would also like to ask like also the state level regulations, there is country level and then UN related. How is this impacting each one of your industries? Uh, insight into that. I can take, I can start. <laughs> I just want to start by saying I love Gavin Newsom. <laughs> Only because of AB 316 that he's opposed to it. Um, no, also because he's, he's very clearly an environmentalist and, and he obviously is, uh, for those who don't know, AB 316 is the rule that is, is coming up that insists on having a human truck driver in the autonomous truck. And the Teamsters lovingly will say it's um, not anti-AV, just pro-jobs, which is, you know, disingenuous at best. What it really is, is we don't want ADS, we want ADAS. So it, it actually is um, farcical. But I think that Gavin Newsom has re is really threading the needle well here on understanding jobs and safety and really letting the industry prove itself, which thank you for once again leading the way and how this can roll out. But on the state levels, these are big issues that we're dealing with that we've got a patchwork um, that we have to deal with and 
the um, NHTSA, the Department of, of Transportation, and the Fed, federal, U.S. federal government is very, very slow to solve this problem. You go to other countries like United Arab Emirates and you have a framework. You know how to interact with the agencies and it's, they'll work more seamlessly with you. And so the U.S. It definitely has some issues in this area compared to others from a regulatory handicap perspective. They, they do, there's significant ones because of the weight difference and rightfully so. <laughs> it is a big deal, these trucks weigh a lot. You should treat them different than you treat light passenger vehicles. That's completely reasonable. Um, but they, these are different issues that would. Aren't there also regulations around how long a truck driver can drive the truck before they're mandated to take a break? And how would that, like, I'm curious, how would that uh, change if like autonomous trucks are a thing and there's a driver in there? One of my all time favorite topics actually. <laughs> so we have remote operators who oversee our fleet of our trucks. Um, right now, they all have commercial driver's license and they tend to have 10 years or more experience, particularly in middle and short haul, because those are the challenging areas that, that we're tackling at the moment. And there are rules that prevent how long that they can drive. The question is, they're not driving when they're overseeing this. To be very, very clear, the ADS system is driving. And so you really need to look at that and say, well, how, how long can they be there? I mean, the, the government actually doesn't have a rule on this yet. And if they decide to go there, I'm sure a lot of us are gonna come and have some very strong opinions um, on what makes sense to this. But it is a better quality of life um, for them because they're able to go home every single day. They're not on the road endlessly. And that's a huge part of it, but I wouldn't say they're truck drivers. So it's, it's gonna be very fascinating to see how we, how we address this. Yeah. And it's definitely unsettled law regulations, all of it. I, I do agree with you though that um, we have a lot to catch up on on the regulatory side. I mean, I'm sure you, you're dealing with this every day. Um, California is definitely ahead of other states, but I think there's still gaps which need to be addressed before robotaxis scale out fully. I think uh, actually there are other states that are better than California. <laughs> Less rules are better uh, at this moment, to be honest. I, I'll give um, maybe two two past experience or data points here. Like, you know, quite a few years back, I was talking to some fairly senior official in DOT, um, trying to understand what is US government's position when it comes to designing or coming up with new regulations to regulate autonomy in general. And then the response I got there really, I guess, surprised me or shocked me, right? Um, the response I got was that, look, you know, the government really does not does not want to get into this. Um, we actually, for this type of new technology development, we really want the private industry to lead the charter and then tell us what to do. And then we look at the public opinion and then, you know, if there's a need, we'll formulate the laws and whatnot. Now, this is a few years back, you know, I'm sure things have changed, right? Um, but generally, I was a little surprised to hear the position of the US government then I'm going to give a counter example or another counter data point. Um, it's, uh, I mean, for us to produce origins safely on the road, they need to pass federal uh, safety regulations by NISA, right? And then these regulations are not designed for, I mean, for autonomy period, right? Like there are a lot of safety um, design requirements put in place for human driving, driven cars. But, um, when we actually, let's say, send our design for origin, uh, our design our origin for uh, federal safety approval, they'll be looking at us like, your car doesn't have a rear view mirror. And they'll be like, uh, why would it need a rear view mirror? We have rear view cameras. Uh, they'll be like, that doesn't count. Um, you need a rear view mirrors. Uh, and uh, what else? Like there, there are just a bunch of, um, safety designs or safety regulations that are 
completely out of date, but, but because there is no momentum or to redesign these things in the era of autonomy. Again, they're kind of waiting for, I mean, I don't know if they're waiting. This may, may not be a fair fair statement, but you know, it's the private industry pushing the regulator to say, look at these old um, safety measures that you have put in place. You know, this and that really do not apply to us anymore. Can you please make a change, right? Um, I wish those changes can come a lot faster so we don't have to put in the rear view mirrors, but right now we are, right? Um, because we just have to be compliant in order to even make these cars. So Yeah, but it's even worse than that, right? It's the federal motor vehicle safety standards are really need to be updated to deal with autonomous vehicles and, and trucks as well, uh, without a doubt. And I know there is some work on that, but what they're also doing is they're hamstringing you on how when you do this by exceptions, you have to cure that exception. I'm not a lawyer, and so if you're a lawyer in the house, jump in, correct me. But you have to cure that exception within a certain period of time, and then they limit you how many vehicles that you can make, which totally destroys your economics, your unit economics and being able to scale this. So it's a really crappy situation that our government is putting a lot of the, the um, companies in. Now, uh, we're very lucky in that right now we're not at that point where we're manufacturing at scale. We're still hand building these vehicles in Sweden. So we've, it's a little different, but I am not just rooting from the sidelines. <laughs> you can read the Federal Register. I get in there and comment to support on these things because they need to change. I'm super, uh, did you have a point? Just yeah, just really quick. I, I fully agree with you. And I think this is why it's important that all like the companies who are leading robot taxis and autonomous trucking work with the DMVs, California DMVs, other like states and also other regulatory bodies to like make sure that the safety guidelines are there. And at NVIDIA, I think like that's what we're trying to do, like just work with all these state bodies and government bodies to make sure that they consider and make the changes. I'm super glad there's all uh, UN regulations and other 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 countries working on it much harder. And I think that will push this forward. Um, having talked about all of this, what one key thing that comes into the more in time in related to the time is being something that you already touched about like how do you work with these with the people in general for specifically robo taxis and in trucks um also like how do you how do you start gaining trust and acceptance to people changing their minds this is not an easy task so from each uh, from way from your perspective what is that uh, you see as that cruise is doing to make a change working with the people yeah, I'll, I, I'm a, always a big pro, uh, proponent that uh, let a product speak for itself. Like no matter how much marketing campaign as whatever you can run, if your product is crappy, like, well, it doesn't work, right? So again, you know, for people who can take the rights tonight, please do uh, and then form your own opinion. Um, I, I think that's probably the biggest um, liver one can play. Um, having said that, I would also say like because we're introducing a brand new technology, a new form of transportation, we're changing the status quo. And the status quo is going to be hard to change. Um, you know, I mean, like maybe sightings like, you know, when the uh, automotive automotive bills were um, first introduced and people were probably complaining like hell at that time too. Like, you know, I know how to, you know, have my horses behave and then, then there are all these cars and they don't actually follow my rule, right? So I think we're actually observing some of that as well um, because, you know, actually as a very concrete example, um, people are kind of um, accustomed to the fact that we have road accidents, um, including fatal accidents caused by human drivers. You know what? They don't really get covered in the news. But if we have a bad interaction with a construction worker, I mean, when, when I say we, I mean cruise cars, a bad interaction with a construction worker, it makes headline news, right? Because it's novel. People are naturally attracted to these like, um, you know, interesting stories and whatnot. So there is work that we got to do in terms of public education, um, we are introducing new technologies. If you look at the general stats, for instance, we're much safer than humans, and then there are gonna be bad interactions, just like humans do. 
but we got to also help our, um, our, our customer base, the general public, to understand that um, you know, there are certain things we do really well, there are certain things that we're still improving, but generally this is the right direction for us to do and then you know, give, give the product a try and then form your own opinion. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the negatives get highlighted a lot more than the positives. And I do believe that robo taxis are safer, self-driving cars are safer than human drivers, hands down. Um, I think uh, trying the product and like actually getting in a self-driving car is going to change a lot more minds than talking about it all we can. And I also think one of the reasons why uh, passengers are against self-driving cars today is mostly because they don't understand the technology, right? Um, so I think talking about that technology, making sure that everybody understands how everything works and like actually getting in a self-driving car and like spreading the word, that's how you can get public trust in my opinion. I love that letting the product speak for itself. It's very true. You know, nothing breeds trust more than transparency. And we need to be very, very open about where these vehicles perform different because the roadmanship is different. They do tend to break hard <laughs> from time to time. Kind of like my son when he was 16, learning how to drive, he would break really hard. So some of these, these roadmanship issues are, they're, they're gawky teenagers, a little bit of it. And yes, as humans, we are gonna be more forgiving of human errors than we are going to be of machine errors. And so we really need to, to work on these things. But I do believe when we show the benefit to society at large, that there will be more widespread adoption. When they see how it's making life, your life better, then people will adopt it. I would love to think that people are gonna understand the technology, but as far as I can tell, people don't even know how their damn cell phones work. Try just explaining that. However, they get really used to it. They know that it's gonna drop. Like I live right next to Stanford University. Should I have a blackout zone near Stanford? I do. It's like almost two miles long. That's crazy. But I got used to it, right? And so I think that, that this will, will help with the, the usages and the familiarity. But I also think we as an industry, we have to listen. Because even some of it is completely irrational. And I'm not saying listen to all the crazies, because there are some crazies. But we should really listen to people and address it. And there's no better way to do that than to get out and speak to people. We do need to be out in the communities a lot more. And yes, there are going to be some groups that are going to use us to make their own point, right? Like the group that just hates cars and only wants public transit. That kind of sucks, but that's going to happen. But getting out there and really being ambassadors and being in the communities more makes a huge difference. When I rolled that big truck out in Selmer, Tennessee, I spent six hours with this thing and we did a giant open house. And it was enlightening. And we have to do more and more of that public outreach and being present and empathy and listening. Ignoring the crazies, but listening. <laughs> Thank you all. And I hope this panel becomes one of such events where we can discuss, have people come out here, discuss about the technology, what you see and what you do not see, and be transparent. And thank you for giving a full overview about robot taxis and trucks and an interesting conversation here. And thank you so much. And I would like to now open the discussion for Q&A. And I see there's also questions coming up on online, as well as anybody here, if you would like to raise your hand and would like to ask questions. Um, I see, I start with the first one there. Hey everyone, um, I'm Malvika. I had a question for Wei. So I'm following crews on LinkedIn and I see that day by day you guys are expanding uh, from one city to another city. So how do you balance that, you know, the trade off between um, trying to, uh, you know, spread out to different cities and at the same time making sure that the product that you're actually launching is, you know, safe and uh, is fulfilling all that criteria? How do you make that trade off? And that's a, such a good question. That's a question I ask myself every day. <laughs> um, that's the, that's the, uh, that's the, I don't know, like a question we are asking every planning session. Anyhow, um, 
I think we came up with a solution actually, like, you know, because we have discussed so many times. So it's, uh, it's fundamental to the business growth, right? Can we, when is the right time for us to scale by how much and how do we actually keep the balance in terms of like, you know, safety, comfort while exploring new environment, right? I think it comes down to maybe a few things. One, um, when we, in a way, like Cruz intentionally right, uh, launched Right Hill in San Francisco first, right? Like, than going to a simple environment, right? Because as you can imagine, it's easier to climb down the ladder rather than climbing up, right? So once we actually, in San Francisco, by the fact that we're operating in San Francisco and then we have been accumulating all these, you know, let's say challenges um, over time, we have seen a lot of really, really hard problems. And people in San Francisco do not drive very politely either, right? Um, and we have so many construction workers, we have very whiny public, Oh, sorry. I mean, we have very <laughs> engaged public. <laughs> um, um, and then as we expand to, let's say, cities that are, you know, less dense, um, more spread out, and then, and then also, you know, certain cities are expanding to have more uh, friendly regulatory environment, um, the problem space actually become easier in a lot of cases. But of course, as we actually expand to new cities, there are going to be problems that we have never seen before in uh, San Francisco as well, you know, different traffic rules, different traffic signs, um, different traffic light configurations, you know, really surprised us. So we thought that our perception system solved this problem and then boom, there's something that we have never seen before, right? Um, so to go back to your question, like how do we actually keep the balance? I think, you know, from the design perspective, you know, we try to actually, um, uh, what we call like, you know, we do scouting trips, we go to these cities to figure out, you know, what are the craziest combination that we can find in terms of, you know, different objects that we need to look at, different traffic rules we need to look at. And when we build our machine learning model, we want to really build for the super set, right? And when we then go to a new city, hopefully that customization on top, it becomes a very thin layer rather than trying to retrain the entire model. The other thing is that, um, again, going back to what I was saying earlier, by by the fact that we have launched and operated in San Francisco, we kind of solved some of the harder problem from the get-go anyway. So when we actually look for new cities, we're looking for areas that are kind of, you know, from the very beginning, what are the areas that are uh, similar or simpler than San Francisco? And there are many of them. And this is why you, LinkedIn, you can see like we're launching boom, 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 one city after another. Um, I think the reverse would have been harder, like if we launched in a very simple city first and then trying to climb the ladder up, I think that path would have been harder for, uh, for anyone. Um, I've been in a cruise car. So, no. oh, sorry, um, for the passenger, should the experience kind of be the same, whether it's for any autonomous vehicle or um, do you expect, you know, it might be for different locations? Oh, uh, that's a great question too. So um, you're touching upon like maybe related to the question first, like when we launch a new city, is, is the experience going to be exactly the same, right? I think, you know, that's our, um, the path that we want to follow. Like, you know, once we develop something, it's not developed for San Francisco, it's developed for all the launch cities and potentially all the new cities we're plan to launch as well. But there is this customization, uh, customization layer on top, right? Um, and that does take some time, you know, the depending on how similar the new environment is to San Francisco or, or not, um, that customization time can take, you know, from short to, you know, maybe hopefully not never long, but, you know, some time to land. So I know that, for instance, in Austin, like um, uh, our pick up and drop drop off behavior is not as smooth as San Francisco because they just have different traffic rules and different way that people actually, inter I mean, pull over. So that's something that we are actually still polishing. But, you know, and then in the meantime, we launch these services so that we can actually collect data and learn from our uh, customers and then so on. Talk about your competitors, like from a passenger, like should I be expecting for all autonomous vehicles? Oh, between companies? Oh, hopefully we're all shooting for the star, you know? <laughs> like, uh, you should not be able to, t I mean, ideally, right? You should never, 
if if you sit in the back sit in the back of the car, you wouldn't be able to tell if it's a self-driving car versus a human driving car. And in fact, like my expectation is that self-driving car offers a better experience than a human driver, a typical Uber driver, right? I'll take two more questions. Uh, Uh, it's a quick question. Um, why do traffic cones placed on top of the cruise autonomous vehicle disable the car? And what is cruise doing to fix the problem? Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, you guys stop reading LinkedIn posts. <laughs> So why? The reason is very simple. There was a movement, um, I think on Twitter or maybe X now, uh, people who are against self-driving in general had this movement to place cones um, on, um, on AVs, right? Um, we're not shy about it. Like we actually, in the very first week, it caused a lot of what we call the VRE event, like a vehicle retrieval event, because when it first happened, our safety, our safety measure at that time was to safe stop the car. Like once an object is placed on a car, if we keep moving forward, you know, it poses a safety risk. The thing can fall off and hit someone or hit a car behind. So at that time, our, our, our car would just come to a complete stop. And that's why the car is stopping. But over time, what we realize is that you know, by doing this stop, it actually poses other safety risk on the road as well. Because you know, if people just keep on placing cones and make fun of it, and if there are enough incidents happening in you know, bad traffic situations, what happens to the car behind? Like we're blocking traffic anyway. So a, bu a bunch of measurements have been taken, right? Like you know, also in addition to placing cones, some people actually went to even the level of like you know, breaking our glasses, damaging our sense sensors and whatnot. So depending on what type of interaction people are having with our cars, we actually updated our safety measure, you know, in sometimes we record a person and then actually file a police report. Uh, you know, imagine if this is a human driving car, if someone's like just randomly placing stuff on your car, this is not okay, right? Like somehow people are abusing self-driving cars just because we lack a voice to yell at them uh, to some degree, right? So we're doing a bunch of things um, to kind of stop the behavior. Right now, so one of the questions was like, you know, with your company, are you in competition like with Tesla? You know, I don't know if Tesla has done like robo taxis, but you do robo taxis. So how is that competition? Because on the news, you know, people have crashed and Tesla's self-driving or driving and, and it's been on the news. So how do you work that out? And then Another completely separate question, but at the end of the day, like, is there a curfew for your robo taxis where between certain times, certain hours of a day, it runs and operates? And then where does the drive, you know, where does the robo taxi go in the evening? Like, do you have a private garage or something? I don't keep up with the news, so I was just curious. <laughs> uh, do we have private garages? I think we do in San Francisco, but that's clearly not a way to scale. Like, we 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 cannot be a real estate company like you know if we keep buying garages that's uh really gonna be very expensive so yes we do right right now um, but it's very limited most of the times we're you know sharing facilities and whatnot especially in new cities um in uh, to your first question is tesla a competitor you know i would say business model wise you know at least right now i mean in the future it's really hard to predict uh if tesla is going to go into robot taxi or not um I haven't read like Elon Musk tweets uh, very recently, but anyhow, right now we are not right. Like uh, Tesla is actually very squarely in the ADAS uh, industry, right? Autopilot and whatnot. Yeah. So yeah I wanted to be really clear on that point. <laughs> that Tesla is not autonomous. That is an ADAS system. That is an advanced driver assistance system. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So it, it, it's a false comparison. And, and, and it's just getting after that one, finally. Thank you, everyone, for the fantastic panel and presentation and kind of explaining, walking us through the technology today. Um, my name is Harry. Very nice to meet all of you. Um, I had a question and I wanted to help us zoom out of what we talked about on a technical scale into more strategic scale. Um, we've all lived the past. We are swimming in the present. 
what do you envision to be the future of autonomous driving technology and not only in robotaxi but the technology itself um, maybe both technology and also from a product side of things like what do you envision to be the future of the technology and the product Great question. Thank you for that. Um, so at InRide, as I mentioned before, we have human-driven trucks as well as autonomous-driven trucks. And our uh, human-driven trucks are all tractors. And right now, our um, uh, autonomous trucks are all box trucks, more like class between class six and class seven. So one of the, the reason why we exist is to decarbonize shipping. It contributes 7% to global emissions. It is imperative that we solve this problem. And we believe very strongly the only way you're going to do that is with electric trucks, autonomous electric trucks, and with digitalization to allow for that efficiency. So what we're doing right now is building out what we call installed capacity in different areas where we can bring a mixed fleet. So that means if it's a box truck, a flatbed, a tractor, hauling a 20-foot container, which is very popular in some areas, versus the 40-foot containers, which are really huge here. But having that install capacity to be able to move the goods as they need to be moved. So the future of this is definitely that it's electric, but it's also that we're solving for the ridiculous inefficiencies in the system right now. Stop empty miles. And the only way you're going to do that is to really understand how these fleets move and through digitalization. So to me, that future is that we are not only electric, but we're also managing the energy because that is hugely important as well. You need to really be responsible with these precious resources. So the future is to have that installed capacity, be able to really drive the efficiencies throughout the entire value chain. So it does mean pretty substantial disruption in, in um, on-road trucking. I think from like just self-driving vehicles, like cars in general, uh, just like horse-driven carriages have been phased out, I think autonomous cars are gonna come in and phase out um, like, just cars that we all drive today. Um, I, I, NVIDIA and I also strongly believe that future is autonomy, absolutely. Uh, if you look at your car today, 70% or 80% of the time it's just sitting in the garage, right? So that needs to change again, the empty miles, like just sitting there being wasted. Uh, if you have a robotaxi or a self-driving car, it can drop you off, go do other things, pick up your family, or like you can share one car within the family instead of having multiple cars. So it's just less carbon emissions, electrification, and autonomy. I think that's the future for sure. I know we were out of questions, but um, I had a, so I use a lot of public transport. So how do you see autonomous vehicles I don't think autonomous buses. I think I don't think they'll uh, work against each other. I think they'll complement each other. They work together and make it better, like easier for people to go from one place to the other. Absolutely. In fact, I think in a, um, some of the Asian countries, like the, uh, the first deployment of autonomy is actually in public transport, like shuttles and whatnot, because there's an easier um, ODD to operating. Yeah. All right. I think we have come to the end of this panel. And thank you so much, Michelle, Wei, Aradia, to be here. Thanks for having us. <laughs>